Hi, my name is Lola Palomo, I'm an art historian and a singer, and welcome to this series called 10 Minute Art History, where we look at the world of art through time. And today we'll be looking at the Dutch Golden Age, the Baroque of the Dutch, in the 17th century. So the last few episodes, we've been talking about the world of the Baroque in Spain and in Italy, which has to do a lot with the Counter-Reformation. But today we're going into another completely different world where there is no Counter-Reformation. So what happens to the Baroque art when there is no chiaroscuro, drama, involvement, theatricality? What happens then? Well, one thing that is very important to the world of art in general in the future is the birth of the art market, which does happen in the Dutch Baroque. So we'll be looking at how the artists of the Dutch culture start to become independent and start to sell their own pieces and collect pieces in the art market. And we'll also be looking at how artists become focalized specialists in certain types of art. We'll be looking at five different styles of paintings, which are portraiture, landscapes, genre paintings, historical paintings, and still lifes. Five different styles of art that when you look at it, you'll know what type it is. So stick around and learn what's going on in the Dutch Baroque and what types of artwork were being made then. See you there. We had the Spanish Golden Age, El Siglo de Oro, and now we have the Dutch Golden Age. Yeah, I don't know how to say Dutch Golden Age, but there is the name in Dutch. So what happens in the Dutch Golden Age? It has to do a lot with the birth of the Dutch Republic, which is in 1581. So the 17th century is going to show us a huge development in art because the Republic has developed itself in culture, in science, but especially in trade. The Dutch merchant fleet is going to traverse the whole world in the 17th century, more than the Spaniards or the Portuguese before them. And so there's going to be a lot of wealth in the Dutch uh, merchant class and middle class and nobility. So there's going to be a lot of wealth that's going to be circulating and there's going to be a need to establish this new social order, social structure. And remember, we've seen in the Romans before that when a society needs to establish itself within its own, a lot of the times there is artwork that is going to help with that. So today we'll be looking at portraiture, landscapes, still lifes, uh, genre paintings, and one more, uh, historic paintings. One thing to remember is that trade has imbued the Dutch society with wealth. And another element is Calvinism, which has a work ethic. There's a lot of mm, constant work as a Protestant culture has, but also within a, a Calvinist church, if you see here and here, where is the artwork? <laughs> yeah, there is not much artwork in religious sense in the Dutch Golden Age. If there is no art for church, where is the artwork? What is going on? This is where the art market comes in. So we have this wealth coming in with the merchant class and they start to want to create a collection of art. The wealthy class will buy and sell and collect art and the artist himself is going to be creating art to be sold in this market. So we really start to see a market dynamic where the artist is going to produce the artwork that is being asked of him. So there's going to be artists that are very involved and focus on landscapes like you can see here. It's a beautiful landscapes that we'll see of the Dutch landscapes. Then we're gonna have still lifes, again, still. We're gonna have some historical paintings. For example, we have Rembrandt that still makes some historical uh, scenes or more allegories. Or we're going to today focus on genre paintings and portraiture because these two styles are going to flourish. Portraiture is going to develop because of the reasons that I just mentioned to create an established social class. But we're also going to see genre paintings, which are those paintings of the everyday. We've left the patronage system. Remember, the patronage system is more about having a patron and he or she, mostly he, 
or the church or the religious order is going to ask of the artist a certain painting and he is going to make it for his patron. In the art market that develops in the Dutch Golden Age, that is that does not apply. The art market is more about a true marketplace. A lot of middle class and mercantile class is going to want to establish itself as a person, as a society, as a family. So portraiture is going to be important. And also genre paintings because they're going to be used for decoration, used to show off that the buyer has had a good collection of art. So there's this buy-sell mentality that is not the case in the patronage system. And it's going to be because there is a secular development of art. Let me remind you of the five categories that we've been looking at. So they are landscape, as here. We have still lifes. We have portraitures. We have historical paintings and we have genre paintings and within these categories of paintings, there are subcategories. For example, in the genre paintings, there is one subcategory called Mary Company. As you can see here, this one, this is one example. Or for example, in portraiture, we're gonna have group portraits, which are typical of this time. Now talking about subs or subcultures or subcategories, subscribe. <laughs> Please subscribe to this channel if you like what you're seeing. And let's continue our story because we have no time to lose. So let's focus on portraits. In this case, we're gonna start with portraiture because it really talks about the people of the society. So here we are with a few of the group portraits of the time. And we're going to start to look at, there are certain styles that are very prevalent in the Dutch portraiture of their golden age. A lot of the times these group portraits are gonna show us the group in the middle of what they, what they are defined by. Another very good example is the anatomy lesson by Dr. Tulp by Rembrandt. And here we see literally they're in the middle of dissecting a corpse. And we're also going to see a lot of portraiture where we do see the Calvinist culture, where there is a toned down sense of propriety. So yes, they were very wealthy. Yes, there was a lot of uh, mercantile classes coming up into society of the wealthy, but the Calvinist culture toned down their wealth so that there were certain avenues where they could show off very purportedly their wealth, but not in an exuberant manner like we could see in the Spanish court or in the Italian court or in the French court. The Dutch golden age is very, very different. So let's look at some portraits by Franz Hals. It was an expensive ordeal to have a portrait made, but at the same time, you're going to present yourself as a Calvinist subject, which means a toned down sense of wealth on yourself. As you can see here, there's going to be a lot of black, a lot of white collars, this typical Dutch style. And then we have another example of a self-portrait of Judith Leister, as you can see here, also very jovial, uh, smiling, and even having a subject smiling as a portrait that she is painting, which is extraordinary. So there is this, bo this double world of portraiture or paintings in general in the Dutch Golden Age. We have this very sober, very somber, very strict and ideological Calvinism in different ways, but we also have this joviality that we'll be looking at more closely now. Now remember our five different styles of paintings. We have portraits, landscapes, history paintings, genre paintings, and still lifes. And now we're gonna focus on the genre paintings because a lot of them are being made in the Dutch Golden Age. And we're gonna focus first on somebody that you've probably seen, which is Johannes Vermeer. I don't know Dutch, I hope this is correctly said. Now, one thing that we've not mentioned before is the use of colors. The movie called Girl with the Pearl Earring, it's very good in art history terms because it shows us a couple of things. One is how difficult it was to make paint. Well, you didn't go to the store and buy blue, red, and green. You had to make these paints yourself. And it's a perfect example of some colors are much more expensive than others. And Vermeer was known by using two colors, this gold color and this ultramarine. 
two pigments that were very expensive to get, but he uses them very much. So he paints a lot of small scale pieces, mostly genre paintings, which as I said before, are paintings of the everyday, but the paintings themselves are very exquisite in how they're made and also in what they are made of. So this painting here called Lady Writing a Letter, as you can see, it is this golden hue very different from the Rembrandt gold, but it's very expensive in itself. And it's exquisite in the details that you see if you go focus in. And the light is coming from the left. I've noticed for some reason, most of Vermeer's paintings come with lighting from the left. I don't know why. Then we have the milkmaid and there, yes, she's an ordinary milkmaid if you want, but that blue that she has on her apron is expensive very, very expensive blue. And then we have the famous girl with a pearl earring, which was a very different way to present a portrait, which is with a completely dark backdrop. And the way she's looking towards us is also something that we did not see. The whole story of the movie really is not the story of the painting, but a lot of these genre paintings in the Dutch golden age are intimate settings, as if we were allowed to look inside and peep inside their home. And Vermeer loves to do this. Now we have here another painting which is famous, the geographer, and he is looking out again on the left from the window and the way the light is reflecting on his face, on his compass, on what he is looking at. In genre paintings, there are subcategories, and in this case, we have Merry Company. And I love them because we have this Calvinist culture and religion where there is a lot of sober and strict law and ways of being, but then we have the tavern scene. And it's beautiful to see how these really just come alive. As you can see here, there's going to be a lot of music. There's going to be a lot of people around a table. These are not group portraits. These are genre paintings because they are the everyday of people. And finally, I want to look at some paintings by Peter de Hooch, which is another one of these uh, very prominent genre painters of the Dutch Golden Age. And I want to look at him because he really does bring home this idea of this intimate quality of the genre painting that we see. So to wrap things up, we've seen especially genre paintings and portraiture, but what the golden age of the Dutch Baroque shows us is that there is art beyond the big patrons, and this starts to develop in the 17th century. And today we've looked at five different styles of paintings. Still lifes, portraits, landscapes, genre paintings, and historic paintings. And those five make up the world of the Dutch Golden Age. Specifically, we focused on the portraits and the genre paintings because they make up the bulk of the style of art that was made today. And then we looked at the art market, which is a fundamental for the development of art later on. Now, when you think about art today, you think about Christ and art being sold and bought and put into auction, this is Christie's or Sotheby's, this idea of buying art to create wealth in yourself or wealth or collect art or to bring a status to your family by owning these pieces of artwork, this idea or the art market starts in the Dutch Golden Age. And this is why we have focused today on the Dutch Baroque. And I hope you've learned a little bit about this style of painting. And next week, we'll be looking at France. We're going to do a little drive into the center of France. And we'll be looking at the Rococo and the beginning of the illustration in the French style of painting. So I hope you've enjoyed this. Make sure you tune in next time. And as always, make sure creativity, as you can see here, is part of your day. Some of these, okay, wait, go back, go back, go back, go back, go back. Um, hold on, hold on, hold on. So, hmm.